thanks everybody for joining us. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to come uh, check this out. Um, I am Mike Raley, PAX Director of Engineering. Um, I usually do these webinars. Today it's going to be um, Mike Gernhardt who's going to give this because um, he and and Elzo, the two you know two of the owners of the company, are really the ones that have a really extensive background doing a lot of fire testing and things like that. So. Um, we're we're doing this because we do um, you know we present a lot of information about acoustics and things like that. I mean that's that's why I'm here. Um, but PAC also has a lot of experience and history working with um, fire rated designs, UL assemblies, um, doing fire testing, and all of those kinds of things. Um, and a lot of times, what you do for fire can affect what you do for acoustics, and what you do for acoustics can affect what you do for fire. And so um, we want to share some of that experience um, and knowledge that PAC has and you know, help um, everybody with some additional information to help further those designs and um, help everybody just do a better uh, job on the projects that we work on. Um, so first part of this series was just sort of a basic overview of fire ratings, things like that. Um, we have a recording of that that I think is up on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, this is part two where we're gonna dig into wall designs specifically, and then part three will be on floor ceiling assemblies. Um, we've muted everybody um, just so we don't have any noise issues. Um, but if you have questions that come up through this presentation, um, feel free to just post those in the chat. Uh, I'll be monitoring that as Mike gives the presentation and we will, once the presentation's over, we'll circle back and address those questions. And at that point too, we could probably also unmute everybody and you can raise your hand or just pop in and ask a question too. Um, so. I think with that, I will turn it over to Mike and we'll uh, we'll get going on this. Great, thank you, Mike. Uh, hopefully the audio is a little better than the first presentation. I actually upgraded to something that uh, will hear us. So I don't have uh, spikes and quiet points within the presentation. So um, let's get right into it. We're gonna go over a wall design specifically, a uh, one hour fire rated single stud wood framed wall and a one hour fire rated single stud uh, steel framed wall. So within these, we have, um, I'm sorry, then we'll also also cover some additional items which is listed or can be found in the general provisions within UL's fire resistive design. Uh, and we have that uh, link on our website now, so I'll, I'll make sure there's a, a link to that that shows up in the chat uh, at the end of this. So let's get right into a uh, wood framed wall one hour design. So this is a uh, U305, which is a fairly standard or very common one hour fire rated wall. It can be built with or without fiberglass insulation. Uh, within this wall, you'll see there's some great numbers here and there's some visual uh, references to um, a general design. The, the visual reference or the image does not specify what can and can't be used in its whole, but only shows a reference to how the wall may or may not be built. Um, you can see here each section is numbered, which is great because that's what we're going to use is we're going to go through each of these sections, uh, starting with section one and we'll work our way all the way down through the assembly. So uh, first line here, section one is the frame. So that is, in this scenario is a two by four wood frame minimum, I'm sorry, uh, max minimum, sorry, maximum spacing, I can't talk, uh, minimum two by four inch thickness, maximum spacing at 16 on center. So what does that mean for fire life and safety is that that's the minimum. So in UL, they, they'll talk about minimums. Uh, you'll see it in, in a few line items here. Uh, here, we can always improve an assembly. So an improvement on an assembly like this would be to either increase the stud size. So go to two by six, two by eight, uh, but still the minimum spacing, or in this case, maximum spacing is 16 on center. You cannot frame this wall at two foot on center and still have your U305 listing. There may be some other assemblies that will allow that, but in this scenario, it is not allowed. Um, so from an acoustical standpoint, changing from two by four wood frame to a two by six wood frame is great. Gives you a little more insulation, gives you a larger cavity, gives you some a little bit better noise control. Um, and that is allowed within this design. Where we might see some variances, it would be if a wall framed at two two by four, sorry, with two by fours is reduced down to 12 inches or eight inches on center, let's say for loading uh, reasons, because these are load bearing walls, that may or probably will change your acoustical performance. So even though it still fits the U305 guide, it is a variance that can affect acoustics. Sorry, Elizabeth, let me 
should be presenting only. Yeah, the Mike, I think you forgot to uh, share your screen there. All right, well, let's try that. I was I was able to see all the images. Um, Let me try and reshare it. Let's see if that helps. You may also try just sharing your screen rather than doing the, yeah. the PowerPoint live, because um, maybe some folks, um, you know, using the web browser or something like that, uh, yep. might not have that functionality. All right, we got some folks saying they could see it. So, okay, Elizabeth, are you uh, still having trouble seeing that? All right, Elizabeth says it works. Okay, let's get back where I was. Okay, so fumbling around quite a bit, but uh, we're still talking about the first line item within U305, which is the framing or the studs. Uh, so a quick summary, maximum spacing on this is 16 on center. You cannot frame this at two foot on center and still fit a U305. You can make improvements, which would be increasing the stud size and or uh, from a fire life and safety standpoint, an improvement would be putting more studs in, putting them more frequent. Uh, from an acoustical standpoint, that can hurt the assembly. Uh, we're going to talk about joints and nail heads again later, but let's touch it now. So um, what this means is that all of the, the nails or screws need to be covered with mud. All the joints need to be covered with drywall compound or mud and uh, tape. So there are no seams left unexposed or sorry, left exposed. Everything is covered. So here's the first big section. So section three within U305 has a lot of variations. Um, there are 22 sub uh, lines, so it'd be three A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, there are some alternates for attachment methods and listed later in line, section six, but um, what the variations between uh, each of these line items are gonna be is, uh, so three A may be one brand, and that one brand may have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten variations within it. So, um, so for gypsum board, you have type X, type C, type G, type AG. There's a lot of variations of five eighths fire code gypsum board that are listed for each of these manufacturers. So that's what typically you'll see as uh, each line item will be a different manufacturer. Um, you may have a, a manufacturer that has multiple lines because they have different variations or different types of gypsum board. Let's say they have all their type C as one section and type X as one section. They might have two lines, but still a lot of options. All of these options may or may not affect acoustics, which is really what we're looking for here. So a type X gypsum board is going to weigh less than a type C or a type G gypsum board. So when you're referencing your acoustical test, you always want to make sure that the acoustical test that, that you're looking at was tested with the type of gypsum board that's A, listed in the U305 assembly, but also proposed for use within that assembly for that project. Um, and you could have variances from, you know, lightweight gypsum board now at, at two pounds a square foot to type uh, C alone, which is just 2.5 pounds. So that's a pretty substantial increase in mass, which can affect the acoustical value of that wall just by changing the gypsum board. Um, gypsum board needs to be 5 eighths of an inch thick and type X, which type X is the primary fire rated gypsum board. Those other uh, gypsum board types that I listed are sub category to type X, so they're all within that fire rated design or fire rated uh, group. Um, gypsum board can be applied horizontal or vertical, so laid down flat or stood up on end. Uh, nails or screws seven inches on center is pretty standard for most fire rated systems. Um, and then there is a gypsum board that is over 48 inches wide. When that gypsum board is used, uh, you have to lay it flat on its side, mainly because in a fire rated assembly, all of the joints need to be backed. So all of your edges need to be backed and no one frames walls at 54 inches on center. So that's why when you use something other than a standard width of 48 inches, you have to lay it down on its side. And then um, alternate methods for attachment, which is our section we will get to on, I believe, the next slide, and that is items um, 6 through 6F. So that's when gypsum board attaches to drywall furring channel or resilient channel. And we'll talk about that later, but there are specific um, details that encompass the, those products. So 
So still within gypsum board is where we get to talk about our products here. Uh, steel framing members, which are the RISC type uh, isolation clips that hold either drywall furring channel or um, for us, our boost that holds resilient channel uh, and also resilient channel by itself, which is actually item seven. So um, within here you have, uh, I think there's uh, seven variations to uh, item six, which is furring channel um, with our clips, with RISC clips or other manufacturers clips. Um, but there is one manufacturer, uh, you see here item 6A that stands out as a clip manufacturer that requires two layers of gypsum board to get that same one hour fire rating. And why this is important would be, um, let's say the acoustical engineer specifies that particular clip, maybe not knowing that it needs two layers of gypsum board. Architect puts it in the spec, it goes all the way through planning, for some reason gets through, um, makes it to the job site. They put in the single layer gypsum board on the wall, and the building official comes through and asks where the second layer of gypsum board is. And that's required on that clip side of that wall to get that one hour fire rating. So unfortunately in that project, you have a potential cost overrun and obviously a lot of lost time and money because of a simple oversight, because maybe an, an, a, an exception was made to allow an alternate in for uh, another clip that doesn't need two layers of gypsum board, or it was just missed in the, in the entire spec in the front end. So those are some of the things that we need to make sure that um, there's a conversation between the acoustical engineer, architects, uh, structural engineers, and everyone else uh, within the system to make sure that these line items are, are correct in the spec and that substitutions don't, um, don't come into play there and cause those issues. Yeah, I've got another person here who's having trouble viewing it. Give me a second here. Mike, I can still see it okay, and we haven't had anybody else comment. So I think um, if if others can see it, if you could just post in the comments, make sure that we can you can see the slides. Um, uh, I think we'll keep going, and um, unless we hear more more folks can't can't see it. Okay. Okay. So uh, U three hundred five. Well, we made it all the way to number four. Now we got through chips and boards. So. Uh, steel corner fasteners. So I talked briefly about covering up the joints. Sorry, move the mic a little bit. Covering up the joints within um, the separation between uh, each layers of gypsum board. So that needs to be taped and filled with joint compound. So a steel corner fastener. Um, I don't have all the details on this. I'm going to make a, an educated guess here. Is that this is for a fire rated wall that makes a 90 degree turn, and on the outside of those corners, usually there's a steel uh, cap that goes on that that gets nailed in and then taped in or screwed in and taped in. So that's what um, this line four is for, is when you have a fire rated wall that needs to make a 90 degree turn because you can't tape an outside edge. Uh, it's not very durable and won't last very long. Uh, so here we get to line five, which is another uh, pretty large section in the fact that there's a lot of variations here that can affect acoustics along with the fire rating. So under the fiberglass insulation, or sorry, bats and blankets, uh, the insulation is optional. And there are 11 variations to this. So you've got everything from, oh, I'm sorry. You've got everything from fiberglass, mineral wool, cotton, blown in cellulose, uh, spray foam. Um, one again, unfortunately, there is a uh, section six with the resilient channel that has some restrictions on the types of gypsum boards that can be used um, with different types of insulation. So there's just some details you have to be able to process through within the UL design. Uh, one of the things you see from an acoustical standpoint is you're gonna have uh, a change in acoustical performance based on the type of insulation that's used. Granted, it might not be a large change depending upon the resilient products that are specified, uh, if any. And um, so it's just something to be aware of that uh, changes can be made during construction if it's a cost issue of changing from cotton or blown in cellulose to fiberglass if or it's maybe a supply chain issue with the insulation and they have to make a change to progress the project so the uh, acoustical variations may be one two three four points uh, you know every system's a little different but um, it's just something to keep track of and make sure that if there are changes that they're addressed and then there's an acoustical test that matches that ideally so that you have uh, real hard hard data that tells you what changes are allowed or can be allowed so item six, which is the pack uh, type resilient sound isolation clips, uh, you're looking at um, 
seven, dif seven different options here or seven uh, manufacturers and or types of clips uh, ranging from a resilient channel clip all the way up to a hat channel clip or, or RISC clip. Uh, these are going to have, again, still we talked earlier in the gypsum board section about that one outlier uh, item 6A that requires two layers of gypsum board to keep your one hour fire rating. I, I don't I hate beating up this one company, but it's just it's a system that um, we've seen cause issues in the past during construction. So I want to make sure that's addressed uh, and at least be everyone's made aware of it so that it's something that can be uh, avoided if it becomes an issue within the field. Uh, and your RC channel, uh, unfortunately for some of the manufacturers, RC channel is lumped into one line item uh, in a lot of these assemblies. So you have several manufacturers that make several different types of resilient channel. You've got some deluxe channels, which are um, either made with a different type of steel. Most of them are still 25 gauge, which I think in here it states minimum 25 gauge, but they're uh, made with a different type of steel, but maybe a different hardness of steel and or a slightly different shape. And all of these products affect acoustics so the the differences between the manufacturers and their design types can affect acoustics i think up to four to five points so even on just a simple wall the generalization within the ul fire resistive design allows for all of these channels but in the acoustical design there may be a specific channel that the acoustical engineer wants um, and that spec needs to be uh, uh, defined within that uh, within that architectural drawing so that the contractors know which version of that RC channel they're supposed to get on their job. So caulkings and sealants, one thing there is we want to make sure that the walls are sealed around the perimeter, the top sides and bottom from an acoustical standpoint, that's good. Keeps uh, flanking pass and noise from bouncing around that wall and, and coming from that dead space or that other side of the wall through the wall, or maybe from a flanking path from above, below or adjacent. So sealing up the wall is good and again, Within the UL fire resistive design, there will be hopefully uh, a few acoustical caulkings that you can and can't use for all joints. I believe the um, most common use, at least the ones I've seen the most, is USG acoustical caulking, which is rated for the wall joints. I don't know if it's rated for the head of head of wall. Um, I know it can be used on wall joints, but I'm not sure if it can be used at that particular position. So check with your acoustical caulking manufacturer for their their UL um, listings and make sure that they're listed in that scenario. And item nine is STC rating, and that's our fault. Uh, we worked with UL a long time ago uh, to get this published within the UL fire resistive design. So if you do want to just use U305, obviously go through every line item, make sure that you have the versions of everything that you want, and then you can submit U305. And as long as they use RISC-1 clips, they can use U305 as their fire rating and their acoustical uh, documentation for that system. So that's... Um, good for us, obviously. And now if you allow for a substitution of a clip or someone substitutes a clip, that U305 is no longer the only document they need. They would need to go out and get the acoustical test from that manufacturer, bring it in and submit that. And um, hopefully no other changes are made and they can get their approvals. So it's just a, it's a way for us uh, to push through and give the um, the contractors and the architects and acoustical engineers a single document that, that handles everything. We do have all the documentation on our website still, so it's all available online. And that's the end of a wood frame wall system. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not. <laughs> so we're, we made it to, to line 10. So we've got wall partitions. So this line item is specific to one manufacturer, which is Quiet Rock QR500 and QR510. What this states is that you can add that to the outside of the fire rated assembly so as an additional layer so you can put in your your five inch gypsum board your clips or no clips or direct attached to rc channel and that half inch gypsum board can go on the direct direct connected side as an additional layer uh, if you have no resilient product it can be on either side i believe um, cementuous backers also that would be used for um, let's say a, a tile bathroom shower uh, floor wall intersection or sorry not intersection but a, a tile wall so anywhere you ha need a either a cement board or a tile backer I believe and I, I don't have um, in front of me I don't have the design so I don't know if it specifies manufacturers but that would be for any uh, bathroom uh, fire rated wall and then uh, line 12 so <clears throat> Mike and I have had a couple discussions on this and uh, here's here's where we're at now so 
you see item 12 in the image shows uh, two two by fours that are intersecting the gypsum board wall. So that is when you have a fire rated wall that has a uh, an intersection. So a, another wall that stems off of that. Uh, the reason they use the uh, blocking there is it creates a uh, fire block so that the fire that starts on one side of the wall can't move through that gap and get to the other side of the wall. So it's a, a safety stop for that fire rated design to allow a intersecting wall um, to not transfer the fire across easily across like the second drawing right across the face of the gypsum board. I'm working on getting further definition on this. Um, uh, hopefully I'll have more answers later um, today or by the end of the week uh, may might be have to be addressed before the next presentation, but we'll we'll get the information out for sure. The bottom drawing is what we want to see acoustically. That's a great design because it separates, let's say, a corridor from a living unit, and that in, that wall that's shown in here would be an interior partition, probably not fire rated, so that's fine there. Um, I will get more definition on what on the fire rating intersection and how that has to be addressed. So the second drawing again is a great acoustical design, stops noise from coming into the unit. The interior partition isn't transferring any noise. The, the top design, if you design that even for an interior partition, you do are you are creating a, po a potential flanking path straight through that small gap where you've got a direct connected gypsum board and then it's transferring noise right into that um, that intersecting wall. So there may be an acoustical uh, issue there. So that's just something to be noted and addressed. I don't know that we can make an acoustical correction on it very um, efficiently other than putting more gypsum board on that other side of the wall and and or adding clips to that side of the wall. So item 13 is uh, mesh netting that would be used for fiber sprayed insulation. So if you're blowing, uh, sorry, sprayed on cellulose type of insulation, and then the netting is there to hold that insulation in place so it doesn't fall out of the wall before the gypsum board goes on. And your mineral fiber boards, I did it again. So your mineral fiber board is um, limited to half inch and it goes against the framing. So you'd have a uh, gypsum board, your mineral fiber board, which is happens in this scenario, happens to be home assault 440, and then another layer of gypsum board. I'm sorry, your framing and then a layer of gypsum board on the other side. So it's sandwiched within the wall cavity. Uh, and I will get into the general provisions. You can also add plywood in there. Uh, it doesn't replace the gypsum board, but it, re it goes uh, between the wall or, or hidden in the wall. So you can still have your gypsum board finish on the outside. Okay, uh, I know I probably blitzed through some of that, but that is the end of a wood framed fire rated U305 wall design. So now we get to go into a steel framed wall. <clears throat> this is a great drawing here because it has our products. It has RISC-1 clips shown in the drawing, so that's good for us. Uh, again, the, the drawings that are on the website are for reference. They aren't for the um, designed by itself. Uh, there are variances to that design, which would be adding Brazilian channel clips, changing stud size, changing insulation thicknesses, multiple layers of gypsum boards. There's a lot of changes that aren't, that can't be drawn on every drawing. So just be aware that the image doesn't necessarily determine what the system can or can't be. Again, we're numbered here, so we're going to go through this uh, one through, I think, uh, 14 in this design. I could be wrong with that number. Uh, the, your U419 has a lot of options, and these options can take this wall from a one-hour fire rated wall all the way to a four-hour fire rated wall. So there's a lot of uh, great information in this particular design. Again, we're going to start at number one and work our way down. So floor, ceiling runners, that's your top track and your bottom track. Minimum gauge is 25 gauge, and the depth will be determined later. Well, there's a chart in the, the next page that'll show us what those minimums can be. Again, we're going to talk about minimums here again for a little bit. So uh, with your steel studs and your runners, it's minimum 25 gauge. Again, from an acoustical standpoint, the gauge matters. So when you talk about a 20 gauge stud or a 16 gauge stud, let's say you have to span 16, 15 feet, 15 or 16 feet in the air. And to be able to use a two and a half inch or three and a half inch or three and five eighths steel stud, you have to go to 20 gauge or 16 gauge. Well, that's going to change your acoustical performance of your system. So we want to make sure that those um, structural requirements, which can be found on the Steel Side Manufacturers Association website within their documentation or on the, um, uh, gosh, what's the other one? Anyhow, there's another Steel Association, uh, Steel Framing Alliance, I believe, that publishes uh, pretty much the same document with the same specifications. 
So it'll give you those span indexes or load indexes for these studs, and it'll tell you what the gauge of the stud and or the thickness of the stud has to be to fulfill that uh, for, for your acoustical engineers or acoustical professionals. That's something to be aware of. Maybe you don't need to be fully versed on it, but it is a very simple document to process through. Um, should be specified in the architectural design for you, for your review, but just be mindful that if you spec 25 gauge studs on a wall, may not always end up at 25 gauge even before it gets to the job site. And there's another cheat that we'll have a little bit later that'll help you determine that once you get out of the job site. Again, maximum spacing on here is 24 inches apart. You can put them more frequently, which is great for fire life and safety, may not be the best choice for acoustics. So just be aware and mindful that these are some very initial changes that you can see within a steel frame wall. And I'm sure most of the acoustical people here have already seen these changes or experienced them uh, in their, uh, day-to-day -day operations uh, within um, within within their day anyhow. Um, so wood structural panels. So wood, plywood, or OSB can be applied to this wall directly to the stud behind the finished layer of gypsum board. So if you have a standard uh, steel frame wall you, and you need a, either a shear panel or a mounting surface for something on one side of the wall, you can add plywood to attach to that. Uh, be aware that light gauge steel and the screws going through plywood into light gauge steel can be difficult. So it's on those you probably see an up gauge. So something a little stronger than 25 gauge should be specified in that scenario. Again, for the acoustical engineers, be aware of that. If there's plywood added to that system, more likely that steel gauge has come up a little bit, which can affect your acoustics. And again, you're going to want to go back to the to the acoustical test that you're using to reference into here, whether it's with the clip or channel, and make sure that that test was done with that gauge steel, with that thickness, with that spacing. Those are all things that can change the acoustical performance, and then also maybe exclude that acoustical test from the UL design that's actually being built. So uh, bats and blankets. Well, and there we go again. Uh, bats and blanket insulation. Uh, we're going to get to a chart that's going to define this. It's the same chart that defines stud thickness and gypsum board allowed to get your one hour, two hour, three hour, four hour fire ratings. <clears throat> and here is that cheat sheet or chart. You've got your gypsum board uh, section, which is going to, within the UL fire resistive designs, shows you the minimums that can be used to build your one hour fire rated wall. You see the first line item there is a minimum three and a half inch steel stud. Again, minimum gauge is 25. That gauge can be increased for fire life and safety. For acoustics, we don't want it to be increased. Um, number of layers of gypsum board. So at least one layer of five eighths thick gypsum board, type X gypsum board, which will be stated in the assembly uh, on each side of the wall and fiberglass, I'm sorry, fiberglass insulation. Insulation is optional. That could be fiberglass, mineral wool, um, cellulose as the, the insulations that are listed within this design. Uh, again, you can go down to a two and a half inch steel stud and actually use half inch thick gypsum board. Now, in this, it states uh, minimum thickness of insulation is inch and a half. Typically, if you see insulation that's thinner than, let's say, three inches, you're looking at something like a mineral wool type of insulation. So just be aware that from the acoustical standpoint, that needs to be verified. Um, we did a steel stud test on two and a half inch with a layer of five eighths on each side. I think we got an STC 56, which is pretty good. We did use fiberglass insulation. One of the advantages of the clips is we increased the cavity depths. We were able to stick with an R11, I think, or R13 insulation on that test. Uh, so we were able to use fiberglass on that test. And you can see the third one hour test down here is an inch and five eighths steel stud. So it's a pretty narrow wall, but you have to use three quarter inch gypsum board on it. And that's on both sides of that wall. And insulation is optional. Again, you've got a small cavity. More likely, you're using a mineral uh, wool type insulation just because it has more um, rigidity and it's easier to access those thinner variations on that. You see the two hour options. Again, pretty small studs. Again, these are all minimums. So you can build a six inch steel stud wall, put one layer of three quarter inch on both sides. And you can use that as your design. That's not an issue. Um, so this is a good cheat sheet or quick chart. Again, remember it's minimums. You can always improve it. Um, one thing I didn't talk about when we did U305 was improving um, or the gypsum board. What is an improvement in gypsum board? So uh, within the design, you can always add more layers of gypsum board. So from an acoustical standpoint, we like that. We like more mass. We like more layers of gypsum board on a wall. Uh, from UL's view, that's great too. More gypsum board means more fire protection on that on each side, whichever side the additional layer is added to. So those are all great things. Uh, one thing that 
we can't do is change the type of insulation. So if it's specified, you know, this one, there's a lot of variances, so we may be able to get away with it. But like on the wood frame wall, if it says minimum five eighths, you can't put two layers of half inch and say, well, it's one inch thick. It's more than a layer of five eighths. So just be aware that uh, we want to stay within those guidelines, at least initially, and then we can build up from that and improve that assembly both for fire and sound at the same time. So in U419, uh, they flipped the, the items. So in U305, item six was the clips. Item seven was the channel in here. Uh, item six is fasteners. Item seven is actually a furring channel, and then um, which includes resilient channel. And then we are, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look away for one second here to make sure I get my line items right here. <clears throat> okay, so in this system we have Yep, item six is fasteners, and that's going to determine the um, type of screw that needs to be used based on the number of layers of gypsum board and the type of gypsum board and or plywood that is used in that system. Uh, so obviously, if you have plywood and then a layer of five is gypsum board, you need to increase the screw length to compensate for that extra material involved, or if you use multiple layers of gypsum board, then you have that same scenario. So uh, item 7A, which Mike just put in the notes here, uh, is your furring channel. So item seven is resilient channel in here. And then when you get to item seven A, now we're talking about drywall furring channel and RISC clip type systems or clip systems. Uh, and it's not just RISC clips, it also is our RC boost, which um, isolates a resilient channel. So under seven A, we have the same culprit here. We have one line item that stands out as a outlier that requires two layers of gypsum board to keep your one hour fire rating. Uh, Mike, please correct me if I'm wrong. It looks like um, I've read this right multiple times over the years, but I want to make sure that it's still right. Uh, so with all of the, uh, the the short code that we saw on the first slide that says here's the minimum stud thickness, here's the minimum stud cavity, here's the gypsum board that can be used. Now you can add risk clips uh, or sound isolation clips or resilient channel to most of these systems, if not all of them. Uh, uh, again, Furring channel can be a culprit here. So uh, we talk about minimums with steel frame, I, and I wanted to touch on it, the wood frame, but it, it came back up here. Um, we actually just had a project here, gosh, not even a month ago. Uh, customers were installing uh, a spring ceiling that needed to be fire rated. We went out to the ceiling, to the job site to do an inspection. And um, first thing that I noticed was that the furring channel that was installed looked a little off. So I took a closer examination and found out that it was 22 gauge and 22 gauge with a hard edge, not a hemmed edge, which uh, I believe all of the clips require a hemmed edge 25 gauge furring channel. So unfortunately for them, they had to remove all of that uh, 22 gauge uh, sharp edged hat channel, which is not easy to do and usually gets deformed during the installation and, and um, deconstruction process that steel usually gets ruined. But uh, the downside is, is that what happened is, is that the, um, the developer called or the builder called the supply yard, his normal supply yard that he always buys his steel from and said, hey, I need this 25 gauge furring channel for this project. Here's how many pieces I need or how many lineal feet I need. Unfortunately, the supplier happened to be out of 25 gauge at the time, but they said, hey, I've got 22 gauge and I can get it shipped out today. Of course, being the construction industry, typically people like to um, keep moving and uh, progress the project. So he accepted the 22 gauge on, job, on the job site and proceeded to install all the 22 gauge. They did everything right, except for the gauge of the steel. And uh, so this it's something that we need, that we will run into occasionally where someone puts in 20 gauge, 22 gauge, tries to anyway. Um, the installation process is very difficult. Uh, all of our acoustical tests are done on 25 gauge. Most manufacturers acoustical tests are done on 25 gauge. So we want to make sure that that is um, part of that specification. And again, we'll hit on a cheat code here in a little bit that'll hopefully help everyone make a quicker uh, review of what those are, uh, what gauge that steel is at, at first glance without having to spend a lot of time um, measuring, trying to measure the steel either with a, you know some type of dial caliper or something. Um, so that just happened to be one project where we ran into a, a steel gauge issue. Uh, and again, um, you might see that on some jobs, smaller jobs where um, the supplier maybe doesn't have 25 gauge in stock or doesn't have an EQ steel in stock and has to up gauge to 22 or, or 20, even 20 gauge type of steel. 
and again, that's going to affect the acoustics and it's no one's fault. It's just the, the contractor and the builder trying to make the job move forward and get to the final stage of completion. Uh, but all of these things can affect acoustics. Now, from a fire life and safety standpoint, those are all fine. They're all loud within UL. But from an acoustical standpoint, those are all things that can deteriorate the acoustical performance of the wall and give a substandard finish or a substandard result for the builder and the, the end user really. Um, OK, so we touched on that. So joint compound, same as in U305, everything has to be covered. Screws have to be covered with mud. Joints have to be covered with uh, drywall mud and tape. Uh, in U419, we have uh, an additional line in here that allows for uh, what I would call an exterior uh, product, so siding, brick, stucco. So U419 can be used as a non-load bearing exterior wall. And these products can be added over the gypsum board. So in this scenario, you might have to use an exterior gyp sheathing that is also fire rated, and then you're finished uh, on the outside of that. Uh, caulking and sealant, same as the wood frame wall. We want to seal the perimeter of every wall if possible to make sure there's no leaks around the top sides or bottom of the wall that'll let the noise move around that acoustical barrier and in and or fire barrier and into the adjacent space. So I misstated, I thought there were 14 lines in here. There are just 10 lines. There's just more options within the 10 lines. So that is U419 in a as quick of a summary and hopefully as much detail as everyone needs. So now we're going to go into some general provisions. <clears throat> so within the general provisions, uh, which we'll, we'll have a link on the website, or it's, it's actually already on the website, and I'll show it to you here in a minute. But uh, within the general provisions, um, wall partitions. So what this line two means is that basically you can add insulation. Any mineral fiber insulation is permitted in a U300, a V300, we can all read W300 uh, or UV and W400 series wall. So what does that mean? So UV and W300 is typically going to be a wood framed wall and a UV and W400 would be a steel framed wall. So that's an easy quick cheat to know that if you're dealing with a wood or steel framed wall without having to open up the, the picture of the UL design. Um, so you can add insulation. This what this states is you can add insulation in any of these wall types as long as the mineral fiber insulation, which is a term that I'm trying to get a further definition on if it includes fiberglass and mineral wool, or if it's just mineral wool or just fiberglass. But um, again, another answer that I'll have to get back to everyone on. Um, so this says you can add insulation to any assembly. So even if you have an assembly that doesn't specifically allow insulation, this general provision gives you the ability to put that in and or change it if it wasn't specifically listed. Let's say you have, uh, I believe if I'm, I may be wrong on this, Kevin, you can correct me. Um, if you have a wall that says you can use fiberglass, you can substitute mineral wool uh, as, as an equal. Uh, from an acoustical standpoint, those are fine. Uh, it'll allow you to increase the um, density of the insulation and or the type of insulation or change the type of insulation, which may have a, an effect on the acoustics. Again, for the acoustical professionals, know that this can happen. Know that there can be substitutions and just be aware of that. So if you do see a change on the job site, you can find that acoustical test that matches that. Um, one thing that it doesn't state in here, and I only touch on this because in ceilings, there's another statement similar to this, but in walls, it doesn't say that that's limited to one hour, two hour, three hour, four hour. So again, another um, definition that I will get for everyone. Uh, so on wood studs, it says, so, sorry, we'll move down to the next line. It says on wood studs, walls of, com of combustible construction. So basically anything made with wood in it or that has wood um, has to be fire blocked for the International Building Code to prevent the passage of flames and hot gases. So what this means is that we have to stop the expansion or the spread of fire. And it has to be done through fire blocking. Now that can be done either with, um, uh, there's a, sorry, there's a, a, a wide variety of products that can be used, and we're going to touch on that on the next couple slides. Um, but just be aware that at some point you will need to stop the fire's ability to spread. Now, with our products and our tests, typically we insulate, we over insulate the cavity slightly. So we have insulation touching both sides, which makes a continuous fire block, which is great, and a continuous draft stop, which is great um, for these. So we don't have to worry about these intermittent blockings that, that may come into play. 
Um, but even then, there, there may be some local jurisdictions that require specific types of blocking that don't allow continuous. Um, they shouldn't, but you, you know, their local jurisdictions have the right to, to make changes if they need to. So on steel stud assemblies, again, we've talked about this. The gauge published is the minimum. You can always increase the steel stud gauge and or size, but doing that doesn't necessarily give you a better or, or higher level of fire rating. It only is still fits within that minimum of a one hour fire test or two hour, whatever you're designing to. So um, again, from an acoustical standpoint, we have to keep an eye on this, whereas wood, we don't have to worry about that as much. So we have to worry about stud gauge and the frequency of the studs, because that's going to change the acoustical results. Um, again, within those systems, we want to make sure that uh, we don't end up with a, a UL designed wall that originally was acoustically designed for 25 gauge at two foot on center. And when you get to the job site, it's a six inch thick 16 gauge at eight inches on center, because that's what they needed to hold that wall up. Um, these are the types of things that we see quite often where even the acoustical design will be set to the minimum standard and unfortunately on the job site by the time a structural engineer gets a hold of it that all of that has changed and now the acoustics have failed really um, to perform it to the level they were supposed to. So I said earlier I would give you a, a quick cheat sheet to be able to walk onto a job site and know what gauge steel you have and here it is. So um, under the general provisions they publish the um, the gauge of the steel, its minimum thickness. So if you have a dial caliper or you have something to measure that, you can measure that. Also, a paint code. So when you walk into a job site, if you've got a non-load bearing wall, you you uh, hopefully will be able to tell the difference between 25 gauge, 18 gauge, 16 gauge just by looking at it or touching it. But maybe from 22 to 20 gauge, you might not be able to see the difference. Well, here it gives you um, a paint code. So on the ends of each of the uh, sets of steel or steel studs, you're going to have either a no paint, a black or a white paint uh, spray paint on the end of it. It allows you to walk into a job site real quick and look over and say, why are those white? That's wrong. That's supposed to be uh, non painted, which is 25 gauge. You instantly know that you've got a gauge change. Um, and if you're dealing with load bearing studs, you've got uh, again, your 20 gauge is white, uh, which lines up with the non load bearing color code, so that doesn't change but you, it does uh, add colors for structural uh, 18 gauge, 16 gauge, and 14 gauge. And I'm sure that the color for 12 gauge, I didn't put, I, I don't know what it is, um, but uh, if you're into 12 gauge steel, acoustics may not be your biggest concern. That's a pretty heavy duty wall, um, but just be aware that, that this is an easy way to walk onto a job site and take a quick walk through and see if there's maybe a stud gauge variance that you didn't expect uh, from the on the acoustical side. So now we're going to get into what is fire blocking. <clears throat> okay, Mike just posted 12 gauge is not listed in the general provisions as of right now. Okay, so that may be something we can find in the uh, Steel Side Manufacturers Association guide or in the International Building Code. Um, so let's talk about fire blocking. What is fire blocking? So there's two images here. Bottom image is, um, well, let me let me define what it is first, sorry. Um, it basically is a way to stop fire from uh, moving from, uh, in this scenario, uh, one floor to another. So it keeps it out of the open plenum of the ceiling by stopping the fire. If it starts in a wall, as it moves up the wall, it creates a, a, a stop for that fire, so it can't spread. Uh, in this drawing you see in the bottom, it looks like it's a soffit, so you're keeping the fire from getting up into that soffit, flanking into that open plenum and getting into the ceiling above with ease. So the type of materials you can use in here is a uh, two by nominal lumber. So in this scenario, they're using a two by four to, to ca cap that that uh, stud bay. Uh, you can use a one inch a two by one, which I'm not sure why you'd use a broken lap joint timber, but it's something that's in here. Five eight structural panel, which can be plywood, I believe, or fire rated OSB or you will listen to OSB. Again, I know plywood works for there. Uh, three quarter inch particle board with back joints half inch gypsum board or cementuous type material, uh, board material. And you can also use insulation, uh, mineral wool, mineral fiber, and other approved insulations. Um, so, uh, you know, from an acoustical standpoint, insulation is probably the way to go, which is the top image you can see there. They've separated two, the, uh, a double stud wall. They've got a one inch air gap and they filled that with insulation. Now that insulation, I believe, is supposed to be secured in place, so they may have a, barrier on top that that is adhered to. 
I don't know, but um, that is a, gr uh, a great way to stop the fire part. Now, from an acoustical standpoint, that's not very strong because it's just insulation shoved into a one inch gap. But from a fire life and safety standpoint in UL's eyes and International Building Co's eyes, that's a great way to stop that. <clears throat> and here's a couple, oh shoot, sorry. A couple more examples of fire blocking. Um, again, it's required within the concealed wall spaces. So in the other drawing, we saw a two by four nailed into the flange. Here is an example of gypsum board nailed to the bottom side of that top plate. And you see there's a wire that penetrates through there that's been uh, sealed around with a spray glue. So um, in concealed spaces, vertically uh, at the ceiling and floor level, so where the wall meets the ceiling, um, <clears throat> and then also horizontally at 10 foot intervals. So if you're moving across an area separation wall, you need a, as you've seen in the other drawing of the top section, you need something to stop that, tr that transfer of the fire and drafts horizontally from bay to bay. So you're creating for, for um, a ease of description, a 10 foot by 10 foot box that the fire can get into and then get stuck in and has to really fight to get into the next 10 by 10 box. Um, it, it slows the spread of the fire within the structure. It doesn't necessarily do anything for the living space, but it slows the spread of the fire within the structure because those are the parts that are holding up our buildings. We want to make sure they stay as long as we can keep them up. Um, so uh, the areas where it's required is obviously at a head of wall, horizontally every 10 feet, uh, and obviously along egress, so stairwells, um, concealed sleeper spaces, and I think that's a, a sleeping area without a window, and also an exterior, exterior wall covering intersection. So you've got all of these areas where you need to add either gypsum board, wood, or insulation, which is ideal for us from an acoustical standpoint because we aren't coupling anything. Um, in this scenario, that gypsum board that reaches over, that touches both these sides, may create a coupling event or a flanking path for noise. So acoustically, we want to make sure that um, uh, if possible, we want to specify either a caulk joint there, and that has, obviously has to be a fire rated caulking, and or a um, insulation filled cavity to uh, create those fire blocking events so that stops a fire from spreading. Another thing that's brought up a lot with fire stopping, uh, fire blocking, I'm sorry, is draft stopping. It's terminology variance there, and I need to make sure I get it right. So before we were talking about fire blocking, now we're talking about draft stopping. Mike just made a note in the in the um, comments that concealed sleeper space is for floors with wooden sleepers, so a floating floor, I believe. It needs to be draft stopped within there so the fire can spread across the floor. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so uh, draft stopping, which is uh, again also brought up in the same breath with fire blocking. It is a little different. Um, so fire, sorry, draft stopping, and I'm going to do this over and over again. I apologize. Uh, draft stopping is um, installed in a floor ceiling assembly for an area that is over a thousand square feet. So in today's new multifamily market, not too many units are over a thousand feet, at least in one wide area. You may have a uh, interior partition that separates those, let's say the family room, living room, kitchen area from the bedrooms, right? So it's going to be hard to get over a thousand square feet in most scenarios, but it is definitely possible. And or if you have a drop ceiling that runs continuous over an area, you're going to have quite a bit of draft stopping involved. And again, you need to make 1,000 square foot boxes so that this, um, uh, there, there's multiple purposes for draft stopping, I'm sorry. One is to um, obviously keep air infiltration uh, for thermal reasons to keep the heat from traveling around. The other is we don't wanna supply air to a fire if we don't have to from an area outside of its containment area uh, because giving it air gives it obviously more fire. So we want to make sure that we can stop or reduce that um, supply of oxygen to the fire to help it, um, you know, either give it time to get extinguished or uh, extinguish out with either sprinklers or uh, burning itself out. Uh, again, here similar materials can be used. Gypsum board can be as thin as half inch, uh, three eighths wood structural panels, where the other one I believe it said half inch or five eighths, um, one inch nominal lumber. Uh, obviously, you can you can use a two by four or two by material if it's a small gap, uh, but um, one inch is the minimum. Cement fiberboard, and again, or fiberglass and fiberglass mineral wool uh, type insulation can be used as long as it's supported. Again, this is where that support comes in, so that insulation can't just be 
Let's say you have a 10 inch drop, you can't just shove in piece of insulation and hope it stays there. It has to be restrained so that it can't fall over and fall out of that area. Um, you may see this over um, an area separation wall where you have joists that lay on there and it's filled in in between with gypsum board or plywood or or insulation and gypsum board. And again, that's uh, a fire stopping, draft stopping event that keeps that fire from coming up and over that wall. Uh, and that is potentially an acoustical leak. So from the acoustical side of it, we want to make sure that those draft stops and fire blocking are treated acoustically as well as possible, but they are required for fires. So we want to make sure that they are uh, built 100% correct. And um, so now, now the, the second question comes is, how do we get to these or where where do we find all of this information? You know, and this is just a review of one UL design. And we've talked about how acoustics can be affected by the UL systems or by the variances with it that are allowed within a single UL fire resistant design. So with that being said, you know, where can you put all of this information together? Obviously, you go to PAC International's website and you can use our fire uh, system selector and you can roll through a lot of these changes and see what uh, basic designs fit within those UL designs, and we'll have links to the um, the UL design specifically, including the general provisions, so you can look up what effects or what changes may be allowed or not allowed within that system. Um, our uh, acoustical design selectors are great because they will usually reference the UL design that that acoustical test was designed to. That's one thing that you um, that we've touched on before, but want to make sure I, we we reiterate it is that PAC International prides ourselves on acoustically testing the fire rated design. Um, there, we have a lot of research uh, R&D testing and some customer driven testing that maybe not fits an exact UL design that we've published, but um, those will be stated and listed correctly. So that's one thing that we, again, we strive for and pride ourselves on is when we go to the, the fire resistive design and we're building an acoustical test to match it, we try and build them exactly the same. Uh, there are some variances that you can put into it that may increase the acoustics technically still meets the UL design, but makes the acoustics perform substantially better. Uh, we're going to try and build what the builders are putting into the job sites, not necessarily the, the premium or elite version of that from an acoustical standpoint. So um, just be aware of that, that that's that's PAC's mission is to, to keep processing those systems the same way. Uh, you can also go to your ICC evaluation services, and those are going to be supplied by your manufacturer. So uh, PAPCO Gypsum Board may have, you know, an ESR report that says you can use this product in U305, and it'll reference the UL design usually, or reference a one-hour fire test specifically designed to fit that criteria. Uh, you also have your fire resistance and sound control design manual, which is published by the Gypsum Association, which is published by all of the gypsum manufacturers get together and they go through these designs and they make sure that everyone agrees that these are the correct designs to publish. Again, uh, the summaries that describe the systems may not be, obviously are not in as good of detail or as complete detail as U305. Um, but a lot of times they're a starting point to say, okay, well, I think this is going to be my acoustical product and I think this is my UL design. Now let's go make sure that these two are talking together correctly. And we end up with the same acoustical design and fire rated design that we're actually going to be building without those other variances like stud gauge, or stud frequency, um, thickness, uh, or sorry, gauge of the stud, spacing of the studs, uh, again, or depth of that wall. If you'd specify a two by six wall, but they can frame it with two by four, I guarantee you they're going to frame it with two by four. It's less expensive. Um, so those are the, the areas where you can come find that information. Uh, and we're, do, we're doing our best to put those all together for you, which is why we're doing this seminar. Uh, and then again, how can PAC help, which I've already touched on. Um, you know, we have a pretty vast experience in the industry working with UL directly, working with the acoustical lab laboratories directly. Um, I think we're into 25 years ish. Um, luckily for me and for our company, we have a large, um, or a, a, a wide breadth of knowledge in the construction industry. So it allows us the um, ability to think like the contractor and or think like the engineer and be able to put those systems together for the consumer, hopefully giving them the best options available out there. Um, 
We have more UL fire rated designs than any other any of the other acoustical clip manufacturers out there. Uh, we're, we're almost capping all of them under one umbrella, so we've almost got as many or more than all of them combined. Um, that changes every day, so it's a very f flexible uh, comment, but um, uh, just gives this lets you know that we're we're trying to lead the industry in that. Um, so here's our fire rating selector as it sits now. It's it's a very uh, limited version of that. Um, I think I sh I touched on it before, and I think the slide's still in here, which shows a, a ceiling design. But what this does, it allows you to to filter down what your basic design criteria is and get to the UL design, so you can sift through those. Um, specific line items and see what uh, options you want to use on your system acoustically, excuse me, at least acoustically, so you can see what is allowed and what isn't allowed. Uh, you always, it also will give you the ability to set maybe a maximum criteria, say, from an acoustical design, if you want to say, okay, they can use two by four or two by six, but they can't space it at 10 inches or 12 inches on center. It has to be 16 on center. So it gives your builder the options like, well, I need I need two by fours at 12 inches on center to hold this wall up, but I can do two by six at 16 on center. So from an acoustical standpoint, you get to keep your 16 on center spacing, which is good, and they get to get their their loads that they need out of their wall frame. <clears throat> so here's an example of the difference between the two. Uh, the last slide was the old system. This is the new system, which just has more definition. It allows you to to choose, um, and this is for a ceiling, which we're going to get really into next session but and unfortunately i wasn't able to get the wall system finished in time for this presentation it's just been uh, pretty hectic here but um you can see here there's more definition there's probably double the options just in the the first uh private release for so this is just for us to to work through any bugs that are in the system uh where you can change uh, the things that affect acoustics is really what we're looking at here there's a lot of other things that can change within the system but what we're looking at are how are these changes of or how can they affect acoustics? So we're talking about insulation thickness, spacing, the channel spacing, joist spacing, joist height, or you know height of the joist, uh, size of the cavity, where the insulation is placed within that cavity, uh, and then number of layers of gypsum board, whether it's one, two, three, four, or whatever is required to get that fire rating, and acoustical test report that we have published. <clears throat> And then within there, you see if you click on the acoustic design, it jumps you over to if you're an architect, jumps you into the architectural section. If you're an acoustical engineer, it'll jump you into the acoustical engineering section. Obviously, you have to be logged in to get to these so that we can um, uh, make sure that the right people are getting the information that need it. And here's our uh, wall selector. So you can see here, pretty straightforward. Again, uh, this. Uh, selection process on the left hand side will be expanding to give you more choices and more options uh, we may even put in something like steel gauge or steel um, spacing stud spacing as an option to choose to filter down through what acoustical tests are available to uh, help you specify or get more definition on your specifications both acoustically and uh, from the architect side to make sure that what you want built is um, uh, a little clearer maybe for the uh, contractors on the job site And that's it for this, what I call a quick summary, which took quite a while. All right, well, um, thanks, thanks everybody. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of information to, to cover there. And I mean, and really, if you dig into these assemblies, um, we really sort of just uh, scratched the surface talking about a couple walls there. There's, there's even more. Um, but hopefully that gave everybody a pretty good understanding of of these. Um, so we, uh, you know, we're just a little past our time, but um, we're happy to hang out. Um, anybody's got questions, um, please feel free to come in the chat, or um, we can unmute everybody. You can raise a hand and and pop in and just ask your question. Um, we will. Uh, we did a recording of this, so we will go back and edit that recording and get it posted as soon as possible. And for everybody that had registered. Um, you'll get a link to that um, that video recording um, as well, so you can see that. Go back and reference it, and um, we'll put. I've put links in the chat to some of the things that Mike mentioned. Um, some of the th links to like the the UL general provisions. At least the link I have requires a login. 
I don't think that there's any payment required for that. You just have to go register with UL and that'll get you into UL's um, product IQ where you can go search and find all of these different UL assemblies and, and look through those. Um, yeah, so I, I did add a link on our uh, fire rating selector page, which is uh, within the Pack International LLC website. Uh, so there is a link to the general provisions if anyone wants to go spend some time trying to decipher what those mean or don't mean. Uh, and again, I'm going to throw the link in the chat here if you want it. There you go. And you can jump straight into that general provision line and uh, see what's allowed in walls. Yeah. Any um any questions? Um, like I said, we'll we'll stick around and we'll do a very similar sort of um, presentation to this for floor ceiling assemblies. Um, I think really within floor ceiling assemblies, there are actually more elements that can sort of in the within the fire design requirements, more elements there that can trip you up acoustically. Um, I know that there have been some aha and oh shoot moments for me as I've uh, learned more about it um, here at PAC and I've d dug into more of those details. Um, so yeah, we'll be doing that. And also for any architects that are involved in this, um, this is not uh, accredited through AIA for um, CEU credits. Um, it's not like already approved, um, but we are looking to, I will be putting together a fire and acoustics um, version, a version of this that I'll get approved through AIA that then will be available for webinar presentations and um, probably um, do some of those webinars just as part of our monthly webinar series as well. And yeah, we'll just hang out for a little bit um, while we still got folks here. If anybody's got questions, again, feel free to pop, pop on. And um, thanks, thanks again, everybody. We really appreciate the time and um, hope to see you at the next session. And I have unmuted everyone. If everybody, if if uh, everybody wants to jump in, if anybody wants to jump in, they can unmute themselves and comment or or uh, ask questions. While we uh, while we wait, we're just hanging out, Mike. I did have a couple uh, things that that came to mind as I was going through. Um, one was um, you'll notice as you go through these UL designs, a lot of the different item headings will have an asterisk at the end of it. So it'll say you know framing members, or it'll say gypsum board, or something like that, and it has an asterisk there. What does that asterisk mean? That is a reference to another section. So. Um... If you see an asterisk like on a gypsum board, uh, just in U305 under gypsum board, there's an asterisk right after the word gypsum board, which means that there's going to be a reference later in here that's going to point to another system. So uh, in, in this scenario, it points to steel framing members, which is item six, which we have to scroll down to item six to see what the definition within that item six is. And that's going to have some additional details on how or why that gypsum board can be attached. OK, I think it also I see that there's a there's a note that um, it can mean that the products have to have a UL certification mark. Um, You're right, at least yeah. in some jurisdictions and I'm not exactly sure how that uh, that applies, but there may be some of these things and you'll also see within um, some of the things like for bats and blankets, for instance, it'll say, you know, that they have to be ones that have a, a UL classification or something like that. Yeah, well, thanks for sending me a loaded question that I didn't know. You caught me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, um, so. Kevin Highland, and, and so for reference, we, we have an actual uh, a representative from UL here, um, uh, somebody that we work with quite a bit and uh, probably checking in to make sure we're not, uh, <laughs> keep us in mind. Uh, but uh, Kevin Highland has said in the chat that it indicates that it should shall bear yeah. the UL certification mark. Yeah, I, as soon as I saw Kevin's post, I realized that I was uh, misquoting that. So thank you, Kevin. Yeah, so uh, like in item six, well, for the risk Eclipse, we have a UL certification that goes on our product. So that particular product will carry that uh, UL certification. Just like within um, the gypsum board section, you'll see five it's gypsum board with a UL uh, label stamped on it with their reference number. Ours happens to be R16638. You know, Pabco's Type X might be, you know, an R2252 or whatever that number is. So it's going to reference back to their UL listing at um, uh, UL.com. 
All right, I see Norrell's Norrell's got a hand raised. Uh, you should be able to unmute uh, Norrell and go ahead and hop in. Yes, I just unmuted. Uh, back in the wood frame discussion, you had an illustration of a case where you had uh, horizontally a wall with uh, uh, rigid clips on one side, and then perpendicular to that, up against the gypsum that was on the clips, we had another wall. And uh, that other wall in this case was not a very good acoustical wall. Uh, but I encounter situations where both those walls need to be acoustically good. And the uh, one of them may be like the one that's horizontal, may be considered a primary firewall. Mm -hmm. And in that case, they want that gypsum to be continuous there. And mm -hmm. you run that gypsum continuous and you try to put another wall up against it perpendicular, even if that wall is STC 60, you're not going to get it. That's correct. What do I do? Yeah, that's a that's a great. Did the video pause for anybody else? Yeah. OK, but voice is still there. So um, yeah, Norrell, that's a great question. And it's something that I, I always struggled with uh, as a as an acoustical consultant. And I don't know that I have a great answer for you. Um, and I think it's something that we will have to dig back into and I, and probably come back and do another one on addressing some of these like intersection details or something like that, because that is a a big thing where you really run into issues trying to maintain your fire performance and your acoustical performance. Um, and sometimes you can intersect walls. Um, or you know, fire blocking might be some of it, or maybe you could use um, a, an approved um, acoustical and fire sealant. Um, but yeah, it's it's tricky. And I don't know if Elzo's still in here. Elzo may actually have. Yeah, Elzo's here. Elzo, do you have do you have good answers for that? Not sure, Elzo. Uh, there yeah, he is. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, it took me a while to get it unmuted. I don't have a good answer. Um, I have answers, but I would not um, want to uh, put those out without uh, spending more intense time evaluating and making sure we're managing both the fire and the acoustical flanking paths. Um, the, the, uh, Norrell hit the nail on the head. This is not easy. Yeah. Uh, this is a really really difficult problem. And I think we have enough brain power uh, to address it, uh, but it's going to take us some time. Yeah, I know and, I can address it acoustically, but that probably violates somebody's fire problem. So. Yep. <laughs> yep. I, I, possibly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I have made some poor recommendations in the past looking at the acoustics, but missing you know, important details, nuanced details for for fire. So, as always, Norrell, thanks for showing up and asking uh, asking really great questions. And I think you've just given me um, what our fourth uh, our our fourth part of this series will be, um, which is going to be intersection details and and other sort of um, digging into the details and how you address them for both acoustics and fire. Yeah, and I think we'll try and address not only wall intersections, but also that wall ceiling intersection that can be tricky for the architect to design and the acoustical engineer to design correctly for both fire and sound. So I think yep. that's that's a great question that leads into a lot of uh, um, possible unknowns that we can hopefully resolve. Yeah, so, so Norrell, if you or any of the other folks on here have particular intersection details or things like that um, that you've got questions about or gotten caught in before um, feel free to send them to us and we'll we'll take a look at those run them through ourselves and potentially reach out to um to ul as well for some some input on those any other any other questions we're uh about a quarter after, so I think um, unless somebody else has a question, uh, we'll go ahead and, and call it here. Um, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Um, and um, join us in, in two weeks.
for the third part of this. And I think now we know we'll probably have a fourth part too, but a uh, third part will be on floor ceiling assemblies. And as I said, um, we'll be sending out a link uh, to the recording of this once we get that put together and, and posted online.